From the Bible, the Bible is very clear. He tasted death for every man. You might have thought that you sold your soul to Satan, but Christ died on the cross for you too. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. It is a lie straight out of hell that Satan can take a soul that God cannot touch. That's a lie from hell. The Lord Jesus Christ's blood cleanses all sin, including that sin. He can save any man, anywhere. God Almighty, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Savior of mankind. How many of you sold your soul to the devil before you got saved? When you shot your arm up full of heroin, sucked cocaine up through your nostrils, and smoked your dope, drank your wine and your liquor and your beer and bed hopped from one hell hole to the next and blasphemed his name day in and day out and the only thing that you lived for was your next high and the next sin that you could commit and whatever pleasure you might gain from it and found yourself sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into a pit that you didn't know how to bottom and one day you awakened and said to yourself I'm an absolute total waste my life is wasted there's no hope for me, and I'm eternally doomed for hell. And then the light came into your heart, and the Word of God began to work upon your soul. And the convicting power of the Holy Spirit began to speak to you. And God said to you deep down inside your heart where you live and who you are, I love you. I love you, and I want to save you. And in your darkness, and in your lost condition, and in your dope addiction, and in your filth, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I love you and I died for you and I want to save you and you felt a hand reach down and take hold of you and in your heart you were able to reach up and take hold of that hand and the very moment that you took hold of his hand in faith he lifted you up out of that pit of hell and he saved your soul and he set your feet on a solid rock and he wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life and you became a child of God by the new birth and Satan didn't like it a bit but there wasn't a thing he could do about it, amen. That's what the new birth is about. And none of it had anything to do with what you thought about yourself. It all had to do with what Christ did for you. Amen. God never one time told you to begin to see yourself in a different light and to try to straighten up the mess you were in and to stop doing this and stop doing that. He said, I've come to you, and I want to save you right where you are, amen. And that's exactly what he did. Charlotte Elliott said, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. So the saving grace of God is a powerful thing. The light comes on. When the light comes on, God's work has begun. The moment the light comes on, you begin to see yourself as God sees you. Not as the world sees you. Not as the church sees you. Not as the preacher sees you. Not even as you see yourself. You see yourself as God sees you. When the light comes on, it's the power of the Holy Spirit of God to shine light into a darkened world. It's the power of the Holy Spirit of God to speak to a deaf ear. It's the power of the Holy Spirit of God to bring life into nothing but a dead corpse. That convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God is the most wonderful thing in the world. For without the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, there'll never be repentance and saving faith. But the moment that convicting power comes into the soul of a sinner, something marvelous takes place. A marvelous thing happens. For the first time in that sinner's life, they see themselves as God sees them. And that's all that they need to see. For then they realize that even though they are as low down as they can be, and as lost as you could be, and as deep in sin as one could possibly be, and without hope as one could possibly be without hope. And the truth of the matter is that without Jesus Christ, you are absolutely hopeless and helpless. But when that convicting power of the Holy Spirit comes down and speaks into the heart of the sinner, the light is turned on, and now you're communicating with God, and God is saying to you, I love you. My son died for you. 
He shed his blood for you. He'll forgive you. He'll save you. He'll lift you out of this hell you're in and write your name in the book of life. And if you believe God, agree with God, and accept the truth of God as it comes to you as a sinner, something marvelous indeed takes place. And that is that that truth that you've received from God about yourself and who you are, which is the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, begins to work a miracle inside you. For that light begins to shine in darkness. That love begins to break that hardened heart. The power of God is breaking the power of hell. The chains of hell begin to fall off of the guilty sinner and the love of God now has reached down way down deep down into the heart of an ungodly lost hell bound child of hell but they realize there's one greater than them one that loves them one my friend that wants to save them and however weak that faith may be it doesn't take a great deal of faith it simply takes trust in God believing him calling on his name when you realize you're in a condition like that and cry the words, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Immediately something happens. It's called the new birth. It's a miraculous transformation from a child of hell to a child of God. All of a sudden, the light floods the soul. The Holy Ghost borns you into the family of God. And from that moment on, you're no longer the same, never will be the same. You are a child of God. Amen. Where's repentance, preacher? That's the day you start repenting. You'll repent more the next day than you did the first day. A week later, you're still repenting. A month later, you're still repenting. A year later, you're still repenting. You'll find yourself driven time and time again, down on your knees, crying out to God, and saying, Lord, God was all that in me, was all that in my heart. Oh, God, forgive me of that. And the Holy Ghost becomes more powerful in your soul. As that repentance begins to do his work, that work of grace of repentance in the heart of the believer, he begins to sanctify the believer. For every time that believer repents, he's drawn closer to the holiness of God. The holiness of God is that part of the nature of God that pulls you out of where you are into his very presence indeed. And every time he draws you closer and you repent more, you feel more the glory and the righteousness of God Almighty himself for he begins to impute it upon your account day after day your faith grows day after day your walk gets closer day after day the spirit becomes stronger and repentance becomes deeper you'll find yourself repenting of things you didn't even know existed but it's the power of the Holy Ghost he's just begun to sh shine a floodlight on your soul you now you begin to see yourself as God really sees you and you see something happening within you. You find out there's a work of grace taking place in you. You couldn't do yourself. For the power of the Holy Spirit to shine in the heart of the believer is also the power to make a change. It is the grace of God that worketh in you. It is the grace of God not only that saves you but transforms you and makes you a child of God. And then day by day he draws you nearer unto himself. A hunger begins to build in your soul. That new birth started you on a path. You're a child of God now but there's more and more and more to the God that saved you you want to know more about him you want to get near him you want to sense his presence you want to feel his holiness that righteousness is something clean and good and blessed that you've begun to feel in your spirit and you know it's not your righteousness you know it was the gift of God it's something he gave you you couldn't earn it you couldn't work for it it didn't come from a man. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And every time that righteousness is applied to the soul of a believer, it sanctifies them a little more. And holiness begins to take place. For holiness is drawing you unto the unseen one, the untouchable one, the unknown one, who abides in his own glory. But Christ is the way to him. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. And every step of faith in receiving what God says you are and who you are is a growth in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. That growth in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus is growth also in the knowledge of God. For Christ will take you to the Father. And the closer to the Father you get, the further away from here you'll get. Oh, you live here, but your heart's not here. I know you walk this earth, but your home's in heaven. I know you're breathing this air, but your spirit 
spirit lives in glory. Every time you draw nearer to him, he does something to you. He puts something inside you. This world cannot satisfy. To walk with God is the grandest thing on this earth. Walk with him. He said, I stand at the door and knock. Any man open that door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Have you been there? Has that work of grace worked in your heart? Has his light shined into your darkness? God never told you to feel good about yourself. He never told you to examine yourself in the sense before you get saved and see what you can do for yourself. That's the power of the work of God, the Holy Ghost, who does it for you. And then the day will come when you'll wake up one morning, you'll look out across this accursed planet, and you'll say exactly what Paul said. I have a desire to depart. I have a desire to depart. I have a desire to depart. I have a desire to depart and be with him. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ he said which is far greater he didn't say that is empty vain hope he said that is the desire of his soul that's the living breath of an apostle of God that's the heartbeat of Saul of Tarsus who is now Paul the apostle I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far greater is it far greater well preacher I've got a lot I have to leave behind here what are you leaving behind here if your loved ones are saved, you ain't leaving nothing. Amen. If those that you love are born again, you're going to take them with you. Well, my stuff, what stuff? What stuff? You talk about a bunch of stuff's going to go up in a smoke. It's going to melt with fervent heat. There's no place in heaven for your junk. Amen. He said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far greater. Once you get to the point where you're really set from the soul, it's far greater. I've walked into the hospital rooms time and time again and stood by the bedside of a soul that I knew for 20 or 30 years. But I knew, my friend, when I walked into that room this time, you can always tell when it's far better. It's far greater. You can always tell when you walk into the hospital room of one who has turn loose of this earth and now they're reaching for glory their eyes aren't the same they don't look at you the same way they don't talk the same way he's breaking them loose from planet earth he's getting ready to transport them into his presence which is far better I've been right by their bedside when it was far better I've been right there when they took their last breath and their spirit and soul sailed out of this world into the presence of the Lord I have never stood by the bedside of a saint of God I never heard them one time regret leaving this world and going out to meet God. When it comes down to the final hour, the final moment, there's another element of grace that begins to work. The grace that got you saved and brought you to Jesus. That took floodlight on your soul when God began to speak to you into your darkness. Remember, friend, you didn't find him. He found you. If you've never heard his voice, that's because he's never spoken to you. Make no mistake about it. You go ahead and laugh all you please. When he speaks to you, you'll know it. When the Almighty speaks to your soul, you'll hear him. He spoke to mine in 1973. I was 27 years old. I'd heard a lot of voices, but I'd never heard one like that. I'd never heard one that could talk to me, and I knew I couldn't get away from that voice. I never heard one talk to me like he knew who I was. Everything I'd ever done. I never heard one talk to me who knew me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet like this one did. And when that hour comes, when that hour to depart, as Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, I, he said, I am I'm ready to depart and be with Christ. He said, I am now ready to be offered up. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. I've seen that grace work time and time again. They get vision sometimes. They talk about beautiful cities on the other side of a river. They talk about mountains with streams of water flowing from them. They talk about angels and loved ones. They talk about moms and dads that have been gone for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Or a child that they carried out to a graveyard. And that little one shows up in that room. You call it whatever you please. I'm going to tell you something. God turns on the grace when a saint gets ready to leave this world. The Bible said precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Amen. I tell you it's precious. You ever been in a room and hear him howl? You ever been in there and see him cra scratch and claw? You ever seen the terror across their face and their eyes when they weren't ready to meet God? I have. I have. I've been there as much as any doctor in this town. I've watched them die without God. 
God. I've watched them die with no hope. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be next to their bedside. There's a spirit in there that you don't be part of. It's as cold and dead and foreign as it can be. And to think that that soul has just gone into eternity lost without God. Take me back to the room of a saint. Take me into the chamber of that one who loves the Lord, who's lived out their days and their time is at hand. Paul said, my time is at hand. I'm ready to go. Amen? Grace for him. I don't have that grace tonight because it's not time to go yet. A time or two I've had a feeling like I thought I was about to leave. What happened to you, preacher? Didn't fear. Didn't even heart. Didn't even race. I said, Lord, if I'm leaving, I'll see you. I'm ready to go right now, wherever it might be. Now, that's not a fool talking. That's confidence in knowing that I'm saved. I know I'm born again. In the flesh, I'd like to live as much as any man would. But I know whom I have believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I know where I'm going. If it so happens that I outstretch you in this life, I leave this whole world in the next few days. They roll my old earthly frame down here and put it in a casket for the folks to come by. Remember one thing. I'll be looking down while you're looking down. <laughs> Amen. You look down at my old mortal flesh, I'm going to look down at you from above. For I'll be in heaven. Don't mourn for me. Don't cry for me. Cry for those that don't have Jesus. Cry for those that don't know him. Cry for those that are playing games. Cry for those who live like they're going to live forever. Cry for those who make a mock at sin. Cry for those who've heard the gospel and reject Christ over and over and over again. For we're just about at the end of the way. It's all just about over. It's about finished, folks. It's about finished. Here and there is a little oasis of truth. Here and there, a church of God preaching the truth. They're here. They're there. They're all over the place. God's got his 7,000 that have never bowed the knee to Baal. You mark it down. This great land at one time had multiplied millions upon millions upon millions of believers. It still has hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, yeah, even millions of true born-again believers. But it'll all change soon. It'll change in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. I preached to you tonight about conviction. You don't hear much about it. I preached to you tonight about what the Bible says about Bible conversion. You don't hear much about it. What you hear is one, two, three, believe after me. Quote these words and you're all right. Pray this prayer and you're saved. Pray the, the, the sinner's prayer and everything's all right. No, it's not, friend. And it's not with you. If it were all right with you, why are you still searching for something? I don't search for anything. I'm happy. I know the one who found me. Well, what is it then, preacher? Salvation is of the Lord. He initiates it and brings it to fruition. He starts it, not you. You say, well, preacher, I have a desire in me tonight to know God. Well, he put that in there. You say, preacher, I want to hear the truth. You just heard it. Well, preacher, can I be saved? Any man can be saved. I tasted death for every man. You can be saved. That includes you. That includes me. Has it ever come on? Have you ever seen yourself the way God sees you? That's what's important. Have you ever really? Because if you ever really see yourself as God sees you, you can't wait till you find somewhere to get out on your face and get right. The only way you'll ever know the Lord Jesus Christ is through the path of sin. You'll acknowledge that you're a sinner. You'll acknowledge that your sins have condemned you. And you'll acknowledge that he is the only remedy for your sin. You'll come to him as a condemned sinner. You'll cry out to him for mercy. And his blood will cleanse your sins away. That's the only way you'll ever be able to approach into the presence of God is to redeem the sinner. How my friend was born in 1946 and showed up on this earth. Why, my friend, have you got any idea how many people lived and died before I ever showed up? Do you understand how long human history has been on this earth before this little insignificant nothing showed up in 1946? And yet he came down to my soul. He came down and called me. He came down and convicted me. And he saved my soul and wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Glory to God. What a God. Hallelujah to God. Amen. What a God we serve. 
that he would come and call my name. The apostle Paul said, he separated from me my, from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Glory to God. I want you to know that I'll take my place one day with the billions that have met on high as they sing the redeemed, the songs of the redeemed. Hallelujah. Born again, saved, washed in the blood of the Son of God. You say these words are offensive to me, preacher. I'm a religionist. I'm a good person. I'm righteous. I do good deeds. I know you do. But it won't buy you one half second in the presence of God. It'll send you to hell in a heartbeat. The only one that can keep you out of the pit is the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you working to make your own righteousness? Do you good enough? You think you're good enough? You belong to some outfit, some clandestine, some dark, some esoteric group where you've hidden from mankind and you believe that some oath you've taken in front of man in that group is going to get you to heaven? Let me tell you plainly, you're going to hell. The only name that can get you through glory is the name of Jesus. I don't care how high you are in your outfit. I want to go to heaven, don't you? I want to go to the presence of God one day, don't you? I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to burn forever. I don't want to go down. I want to go up, don't you? Don't you? Do you want to go up or do you want to go down? Do you want to go out in the presence of God Almighty where he liveth forever and ever and ever? Where he creates new universes and new worlds. Where all he has to do is say the word and the thing you've never thought of comes into existence. Angels marvel at the creator. It's never crossed their mind what he's able to do when he hung upon that cross and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He had complete control over life and death. They never took his life from him. He gave it to the Father. Here is one who says, I live, you live. I live, you live. Here is one who walks on the water. He says the word and dead men come forth. He's the one that can touch the leper and my friend that can be healed by the power of God and yet he cannot be contaminated himself. He cannot be perverted himself. In the Old Testament, the priests could not touch a leper. They could be contaminated by doing that but you cannot contaminate the Son of God. Why, preacher? Because he was holy. As he lived among us, he lived a holy, pure life. If you start walking with God and talking with God, get yourself a prayer room. Get yourself serious with the Lord. Get serious about your faith. Quit giving lip service to your God. Quit, quit, my friend, all this blather coming out of your mouth and have something happen to your soul. You'll be amazed at how holiness will begin to settle down on you. That doesn't mean that you're good. It doesn't make you better than other people, but it begins to build a wall, a wall of separation that they cannot cross over. You're not contaminated as much with the filth and slime and garbage that you're going to walk out into in just a few minutes. You're going to walk out into hell. The minute you walk out that back door, you're walking into a filthy sewer. You got that? That's all that is. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses you from all sin. Yes, hallelujah. There's a holy separation that takes place. So many people think that separation means I quit this and I quit that and I quit. No, it's nothing you do. Separation has to do with what he does in you. It's a work of grace that's worked in your soul when he begins to build a wall between you and this filthy world that you live in. You might be in captivity right now. Some of you may be in slavery and bondage to something. Satan may be beating you to death. He may be wearing you out, but you're too proud to let anybody know it. You're too proud to even ask for prayer. But deep down inside your soul, you're dying. And you wonder, how can I get any help? Let me tell you who will help you. Let me tell you somebody loves you like nobody loves you. Let me tell you about Jesus. All you got to do is find your place and say, Lord Jesus, help me. And he'll help you. Oh, he'll help you. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Here's another way of saying that. I'm the eternal one. Then in verse 16, he said, I, Jesus, 
have sent mine angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Now watch this. The bright and morning star. That's beautiful. But he's beautiful. Everything about him is beautiful. Amen. Everything about the Lord Jesus Christ is beautiful. I've never found a thing about him that isn't beautiful. Everything I've ever learned about him fires my soul and increases my faith in him. He's wonderful. He'll be with you in the darkest hour of your life. He'll be with you when you think you're going to die. And nobody else can do a thing to help you. He'll be with you. He'll be with you when you've come to the end of your road and sin has finally gotten you to where you, he got your attention. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. He'll be with you. He'll be with you when your wife leaves you, when your husband leaves you, when your children leave you, when you get fired from your job, when everybody in the world leaves you and turns their back on you and there's nowhere else to go, he'll be with you. He said, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you. He'll be with you. He is faithful. He can go with you when all the rest of the family is told by the doctor, you go over to the waiting room now and I'll come out and see you when I get done. I'm a pastor that's been at this a long time and I've gone into that waiting room with families when they didn't know if their loved one was going to come out or not. And then the doctor would come out and have a smile on his face and say everything's okay. But I've been there when the doctor came out and he was just kind of looking down at the ground said, I'm sorry, we did everything we could, but we couldn't save him. But I don't care who you are, he'll go with you all the way into the room, through the doors, on the bed, and past what the anesthesiologist can do, past what the surgeon can do, past what the nurses can do, he'll go with you all the way to the end. When I come to the river of Jordan, I want to be able to put my foot down into that river. I want to be able to touch it like those did in the Old Testament. And when I touch the river of Jordan, it stops and opens up. What does that mean, preacher? That means death cannot touch you. And when you touch that river, you walk across, and he'll be waiting for you on the other side. And he'll be with you as you go through, and your loved ones. Some of you will have a daddy. Some of you will have a mother. Some of you will have a wife. Some of you will have a husband. Some of you will have a little girl. I've been out there, caskets about this big, or a little boy, and you haven't seen them in 10 years, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and the moment you cross that river, there they stand with their little smiling faces and say, welcome home, mommy. Welcome home, daddy. Welcome home, husband. Welcome home, wife. I've always loved you. I always will love you. Now I can love you forever, and it'll never be broken. No graveyards, no sickness, no sorrow, no death. It'll be the love of God shed abroad down upon your soul. A pure love, a perfect love that cannot be tainted. There's nothing that I could ever think of any greater than that. I'll see a man who was born while Jesse James was still robbing banks. And he raised me and died in 1969. And when I cross that Jordan, I'll see him standing right there waiting for me. You don't think heaven and home will be a welcome home? The only way you'll ever make it to where I'm talking about is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Please understand me. There is no way into heaven but by the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Thank you for coming in here. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for breaking the power of hell that came down upon us. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for blessing your word. There's somebody in this house this morning, Lord, they're going to receive something. They're going to get something from God. They're not going to be cheated again. They're not going to walk out this door in the same shape they came in. They're going to get something from God. They're going to do it now. They're going to cry out to you. They're going to call up on you. They're tired. They're sick and tired of the mess that their life's in. They want something good. I pray for them. I pray that they won't let Satan defeat them another day. In Jesus' name, amen.